After this uh, wonderful week, it is, uh, it is very appropriate that we are led back to a point uh, of consideration of uh, uh, community. And it is a, uh, it's a privilege to welcome John McKnight. Um, I would encourage you to read more about uh, him and his bio. You all have a sheet like this. Uh, I would encourage you to do that. Um, uh, John's life, he tells me, has and career has two distinct parts, one in which he was very much involved in uh, civil rights and uh, neighborhoods, and the second in which he has done a great deal of writing and research and so on, uh, all designed to make us better at considering civil rights and neighborhoods. Uh, but uh, I will tell you that his work is extraordinary uh, and has helped to reframe public policy and more importantly to reframe individual lives. Uh, please welcome John McKnight. Well, I'm very happy to be here, to be with uh, one of my oldest colleagues, Bill Gaventa. The known of longest, 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 longest yeah, not old. Right. <laughs> and also, it's just by coincidence, but uh, the other great gathering of people who are concerned about disabilities, I think, happens every summer in Toronto. It's called the Toronto Summer Institute on community and inclusion. And uh, I was one of the people who started that 26 years ago. And it uh, now has grown to maybe two to 300 people every year from around the world who have, I think, many of the same concerns you have. So let me invite you now. I'm sure it'll be next July. You can find out about it at a site called Inclusion Press, which has also all kinds of publications would be interested to anybody in this room. Uh, I don't want to purport, however, to be a person with a special knowledge about something called disability. Uh, the work that I've been involved in all my life has to do more with neighborhoods and communities. And so if there's something that I can share, it has to do with the question of communities thinking about it in terms of inclusiveness. One of the things that the word community brings to mind is what are we thinking about? And then you realize that everybody's an expert. This is not a question of atomic physics where you aren't an expert. There's no person who is not an expert on community. And so here I am supposed to share something with you about community. How could I do that? You're an expert already. Uh, it reminds me of a famous Sufi story. You know, Sufi stories. They're wonderful. They have the moral of the stories at the beginning. And the moral of the one of the stories is that you will only learn what you already know. You will only learn what you already know. And this is the story. It takes place in a little village out in the desert, I presume, someplace in the Middle East. The people there have had a lot of trouble. And the trouble doesn't go away. So they heard that uh, in a village of several miles away, there was a very wise person. And maybe they thought she could help us if she wanted trouble. So they invited her into the village. And uh, she began by saying, you know what I'm going to tell you. And they all said, no. And she said, well, you will only learn that you already know if you don't know what I'm going to tell you. I'm leaving. I can't wait. They're stuck. And the troubles continued, and they thought out what she said. And so finally, a month later, they invited her back, and she, they were all in the square, and she said again, do you know what I'm going to tell you now? And they said, yes. She said, well, then obviously I don't need to speak. And she went back <laughs> home. And then 
the troubles continued. They brought up eyes, and they became wise, and they said when she came back for the third time, she began, you know what I'm going to tell you. And they had thought it all through. And so the people on this side of the square all said yes, <laughs> while the people on this side of the square all said no. So when she asked the question, you know what I'm going to tell you, she got a chorus of yeses and no. And she said, will the people on this side of the square then tell the people on that <laughs> side of the square? And she left and never came back. And that night, there was an old lady who had a dream. And she came to the square the next morning. And she said, I know what it is she's come to tell us. She says, it is that the ultimate wisdom is always within a community and never in outside experts. Which is why I'm leaving at this point. <laughs> Uh, why am I not leaving? I'm not leaving because uh, we're travelers and maybe have been places you haven't been. I'll tell you a little bit about what's on the other side of the horizon. Community is a word that uh, resides in each of us. There's a meaning, and I thought it'd be helpful for us to understand what we mean by community if. Uh, we could get each of you to be uh, precise about it. Uh, some time ago, a friend in another city called me up and said her husband was coming to Chicago for a conference and he had a day off. Could I show him the community? And I said, sure. And uh, so the night before I was pick him up at the hotel, I had to become real about community. She wanted me to show him my community. And uh, I found that a, a wonderful challenge. So what I'd like to do is to ask you right now, if I could come and visit you for just one hour, you only have time to take me one situation or place or expect whatever you choose. It is the heart of your community. Where would we go? What would I experience and what would I see? Part of your community. And by your, I mean Sue's community. Take just a minute. What is the heart of your community? Okay, take just one more minute and share that with the person next to you. That is your favorite system. Share and I hearts of Let's just, uh, you all have one other idea. Okay. Let me just go down the road here so we can all hear ideas about the heart of community. People, just two or three words, no more. Here we are. Spokane River Park for the town turnaround 
came in Expo 74. That's one, two, or three, sorry. <laughs> I have a lot of communities in my life, so it's hard to choose why these are my father's house, because that's what we gather as a family. Uh, a wonderful place in the hill country of Texas called Utopia and Heaven Friends. The, uh, the volunteer fire department and EMS in our little community. No. It's the place between where people meet the intersection. The break room at the center for the vision impaired in Atlanta. Mm -hmm. The information help the lives of those with deep life. We would walk to the community breakfast at Grace United Methodist Church in uh, downtown Rochester. Uh, the congregation, I think. Family. Family. Now you can see that when I say community, somebody has a place in mind, somebody has a gathering in mind. Somebody has a church in mind, right? And what we have come to realize is everybody has something different in their minds. So if you're going to do community planning or a plan for inclusion in community or anything where a group of people think they're doing something together about community, one of the problems is that the discussion often isn't very effective because people don't have the same thing in their mind. And so I was a neighborhood organizer for about 20 years in Chicago neighborhoods, and then I got invited to come on the faculty of Northwestern University to start a program in community studies. And so I was up against it, wasn't I? What was, what was I going to do? What did the community mean that we were going to study? So I went to the sociology department. They're the people who know about groups of people. And I sat down with several of the faculty and I said to them, give me a useful uh, and, and, and correct definition of community. Now, there is one of the worst ideas that I <laughs> Bring your sleeping bag. <laughs> and actually, if you get anything useful, I got one idea, however, that was very important. So let me share that with you. And that is one of the faculty said, Community is a word that denotes a group of people who come together because of some kind of affinity. And by doing that, they necessarily create outsiders. We have a wonderful dog here, who is a, I think, a Labrador retriever? Yep. Yeah. And uh, uh, we've always had Labrador retrievers as well. We belong to the Chicago Area Association of Labrador Retriever Owners. <laughs> and we go to a Cook County Forest Preserve on the fourth Sunday afternoon of every month in a parking lot. And we all bring our dogs. And do you know what we do? We talk about the world's greatest dog. <laughs> we all know that this is the world's greatest dog, right? And the dogs sniff each other. And it's a wonderful gathering of people held together by an animal. And one day, there's a walking path that comes to the parking lot, and down the path came a woman with a German shepherd. Yes. Now, do you see the dilemma? <laughs> we're sweet people, we're full of love, we're full of love dogs, we're a loving circle, and we don't want that second-rate dog in us. <laughs> <laughs> so that's what the sociologists pointed out that we had never thought of. Right? That no matter what your intention is, 
how good what holds you together may be. You are, by definition, creating outsiders. And so the question is, how do you deal with that? A great woman philosopher, a good friend of mine in Toronto named Judith Snow, who is a leader in the disability movement in uh, Canada, once said to me as we were talking about this, this is why it is the mission of each of us to make sure that whatever group we're associated with, that we always have a welcome at the edge. I thought it's so wonderful. And a welcome at the edge has a word, we all know, I think, which is hospitality. And hospitality is a word that comes from a Indo-Germanic root, which is hus, and it, 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 it meant enemy. And uh, it came to mean stranger or enemy. H hostile, the word hostile comes from hus, enemy. But it began to transform itself into just stranger, and so, the, by the time the Greeks were using it, it, it meant the welcoming of a stranger. Hospitality, the welcoming of a stranger. So you can't give hospitality to a friend, <coughs> technically. You can only give hospitality to a stranger. And that's what a welcome at the edge is, hospitality. So, I think that may be a, a good way of thinking about the center of our concerns about community. Is are they hospitable places? Now I did have to do something uh, to, uh, to decide what I meant by community. The sociology chair actually said, "You'll have to make it up." Every every word community is something somebody means that isn't is the word. And so I got a little crew of other people like me who have been organizers from the university. And uh, we began to do uh, some research. And our research began by going uh, door to door in neighborhoods and asking people this question. It is, can you tell us what people who live here have done together to make things better? Can you tell us what people who live here have done together that has made things better? We thought that was a way of understanding the community as a dynamic or actionable place rather than just the definition of a word. And believe it or not, we went to two of the 20 cities, 300 neighborhoods, and collected about 3,000 answers to that question. So we ended up with more stories about what made successful initiatives in local places and neighborhoods, I think, that anybody had ever collected. And then we had to, how, how are we going to share that with somebody else? So, uh, nobody read a book of 3,000 stories. So we decided to look at each story and ask this question. What is it that people used in this story when they were making things better? Now, I gotta be frank with you, the reason we asked that question was that we went almost exclusively to older inner city neighborhoods that were always called by some people needy. These were needy neighborhoods. But the stories told us that the truth of the matter was that there were, they were doing things there with what they had to make things better. And yet the people who looked at them, looked at them as deficient, needy, problem neighborhoods. So we thought we could add something to, to the knowledge of people who were concerned by identifying what was there. What was there that they were using in these stories and uh, after looking at all 3,000, we concluded that there were five resources 
that they were using and that they existed in almost every community. And uh, so we had to name these resources and we decided to name them assets. An asset being something that is usually small at the beginning, but if it's well invested, connected, it grows bigger and bigger. So we said there are five assets, <clears throat> and because we are learning geographically, we developed what we call an asset map. And that's what I'd like to share with you because for people who are interested in inclusive communities, we found this asset map is very useful. It's useful for anybody interested in community development, but I think especially for people who are interested in inclusive communities. <clears throat> Now these five assets weren't used in every story. Some, I mean, no story used all five. Might be asset one and asset three, or asset two and asset four, or two fours and five threes. But anyway, we could say, here, here's the raw material, the ingredients or the building blocks that people used in stories uh, when they did something that made things better. So the first thing, the first asset, the universal asset, the flower and the cake, the one ingredient in every one, is local residents. Right? Now, you remember how we began this? You will only learn what you already know. I'm going to tell you absolutely nothing you don't know. Because you, you live in a place called the community. The first asset is the residents in the neighborhood. That is not a stunning conclusion, <laughs> but it is an amended idea because you'll notice that, that it is group, uh, it is individuals, gifts, talents, and capacities, and not their deficits, problems, and needs. So that's the first asset. Second asset is groups of people who come together in the neighborhood and they are usually smaller face-to-face -face groups where the members do the work and they're not paid. Although they may have a paid member like a pastor or a uh, organizer or a secretary but their essence is that the members who do the work are not paid. And so our graphic center came up with this high-tech graphic. <laughs> and they are the groups, organizations, clubs, associations in local neighborhoods that appear in the stories. And uh, they appear very frequently. And at the end of uh, each interview, we would say, where did this story of things getting better begin? And in more than half of all the stories, they begin with these groups. Not agencies, but these groups. And so there's a historic name for these groups, which is associations. And uh, associations are powerful because they are the way we magnify and amplify the gifts and the capacities of individuals. You give a choir, there are 20 people in the neighborhood who have the gift of a good voice, and you put them together in a choir, you create an association that magnifies both for each of them, the music they do, and it magnifies for the community as well. And so we know that the associations are very, very important because they appear so often in stories of making things better. And uh, we worked with a lot of neighborhoods, helping them make uh, maps, finding out what the associations are in their neighborhood. And a typical list of the kinds of associations that exist in neighborhoods. Those of you down there may be able to read them over there. Right. Uh, these kinds of groups. <coughs> right. So 
So that's the second asset. And if you put them on the map, then this, this is asset one, the gifts to the local residents, asset two, the multiplier of those gifts, the local association. The third asset that appears in the story is groups of people in the neighborhood who come together to do things, but they're paid, unlike the association. And we all know that there are three flavors of paid people in neighborhoods. And one is called businesses, and one is called not-for-profits, and one is called government. So we have the mom and pop store, a warehouse might be a business, not-for-profit might be a Y, or might be a child care center, and government institutions like parks, libraries, police stations, schools. And so they appear in the stories. So we went to the High Tech Graphic Center and said to them, give us a symbol for a map for those. Give us three symbols. And they came back and they said, you only need one. And we were stunned, but they were right. Mm -hmm. Do you, you have those around where you are? That's a, that's a, a map of how almost all businesses, not-for-profits, and government institutions are organized. And we all probably are pretty closely associated with one. I am. In the Graduate School of Management, we said, why do people organize this way? We know why they organize themselves in associations, neighbors, kinds of other affinities. Why do people organize themselves this way? We wanted to know because of Northwestern University, this is the way we look. Most agencies, it's the way they look. So why do people organize themselves that way? And at the Kellogg School of Management, one of the first or second best graduate schools of management, the professors are, unlike the sociologists, perfectly clear why we organize ourselves that way. And it is so a few people can control a lot of other people. You're with me? The slide is an organization chart with one box at the top, two beneath it, six beneath it, twelve beneath it, all the way down. It's the triangular. So institutions appear in the story, but they are very, very different than associations. Because associations don't have any power to control anything. Associations are gatherings of people by consent. Institutions are gatherings of people in a system of control. And the glue of an institution is money. The president of our university says we're a community of scholars. Sounds like <laughs> The day he doesn't send us a paycheck at the end of the month, will dissolve as a community the next week. But an association not having money is held together by something else. And it's care. People care about the same thing or care about each other. And one of the great linguistic tricks of the last century is to begin the institutions beginning to use the word care so they could care. But they can't. Medicare doesn't care. <laughs> <laughs> it's a bureaucracy sends out checks. And so if you really are interested in care, then you've got to be operating in the world of community and association, not the world of institutional connection. Now, let's put that on the map. Right. So there are the not-for-profits, the businesses, and the government institutions, they appear. The fourth asset is, is the stage on which these three kinds of human actors play. 
right? And that's the land and the physical improvements on it. There are assets in the neighborhood. On my block, we had a vacant lot that we made into a top lot. It, we, it became an asset even though it looked like a vacant, vacant lot. And the fifth asset is exchange, people, sharing, trading, bartering, giving, exchange, buying. Every story is a combination of one of those two books. And what let me then tell you a story that, that embodies all of the three things that all this research tells us about community that is useful and do the work. And it there is a typical kind of story, actually, uh, that I got from a woman in the neighborhood of Chicago called Longdale. I knock on the door and she comes and I explain what we're doing and, and say to her, can you tell us what people in this neighborhood have done to make things better? And she uh, thought for a minute and then she said, well, said about uh, three years ago my daughter became a teenager and summer vacation came and she just ran around all summer with the girl next door, but by the end of the summer I could tell that they were about to go down the wrong path. And that the next summer, I better have figured out something for my girl to do. And she thought of what could her girl do. And then uh, she came up with several ideas. So she knew her girl who would be hard to separate from the girl next door, so she went to the mother next door and explained to her her concern and what and the idea she had. And the mother next door thought the same thing she did and added some things that they could do, and they got a lot of fun. You know, she says, made up things for the girls to do. And then they had more things for the girls to do than they could handle managing. And so they got six other mothers on the block who had teenage daughters that they knew of, they said, and uh, brought them together a potluck to explain the same thing. And they all thought it was a great idea. She said, we have a couple more potlucks before the summer, and came up with a whole bunch of things for the girls to do, and one of them only had to take every eight a day, because there were eight, eight of us. So we could handle that pretty well. We now had more things to do with more girls than we had room in anybody's house, so we went across the street to Lake Park and asked them, uh, the manager, for a room. He said we could have a room on the second floor. We met there every morning, and we did our things, and I said, what things did you do? And she began to tell me, I went on, on, on. So uh, let me summarize, because there are three things I think they're made to do. First thing is they took the girls to all kinds of institutions to learn about what they do. Like they took them to an insurance company. And an insurance company, she said they learned about insurance, which they were never going to learn about in school. But they really needed to learn about it. And she said then we discovered that they wanted to show us around, and as they would walk around, they could see young women almost like themselves working there. And all of a sudden, she said, they began to have a whole new world of ideas about what they might do with their life, at least vocationally. So then that was really transforming the third place. Second thing they did was that there were several, art there were two mothers who were artistic. And so they knew other artistic people in the neighborhood and asked them about other artistic people. And they brought in an artist for a day with the girls of different kinds of arts. So that they, the girls got the experience and introduction to all of, the, all of the major arts. And she said, five of the girls are now continuing to work with these artists. Third thing they did was they asked the girls to engage in a project that made the block better each of the three months of the summer. And the example she gave me was, why didn't she, you see the flag in front of our house? She said, the girls decided it'd be nice if we had a family flag in front of every house. And so they went to every house and asked people to figure some symbols that represented their family now and historically. And then they made those flags. They, they cut out the symbols and put them on. It's like, I, I, it was like the coat of arms for the reason. And then she said one Saturday when they're all done, we all came out, hung on our flags, and we went from 
house to house and each man spoke about what the symbol meant on their flag. She says, all the ones who knew more about each other we would have built a lifetime of a So those are the three things that they did. And then she said, uh, you know, um, the most important thing that happened is that we broke the line. We broke the lines between the mothers. We broke the lines between the girls. We broke the lines between the mothers and the girls. And we're a real community now. Breaking the line. <coughs> and I believe that. Did you notice how many grants they needed? <laughs> Did you notice all the technical assistance that they needed? So that's what I could report to you is the essence of the story that we collected in the answer to that question. And it is three things that we have learned. And it is number one, that what makes things better is the assets in the neighborhood. And if you don't know what they are, you don't have any building blocks to start. And the second thing is that the assets have to be connected. In our story, a woman with the gift of imagination and belief she could change her daughter's life, created an association of mothers and connected them to a park. Everything was there. But what she did was precipitate connection. And that's true of every story about how local people made things that they created connection. You see where we're going for inclusion? And the third thing is that knowing the first two won't make anything happen. In every story, you can determine that there was some individual, some association, or some institution that was the precipitating connector. So every story of community improvement and change, it is about, that is resident is about assets being connected and connectors being vital little footnote about connectors being vital. When we began this, we were mostly all old neighborhood organizers, so we thought leadership was important. We changed our minds against everything we do to That is, for real community building, it is a connector that is more important for and leader. Now, a leader may be a connector, but connector most often, I'm leader. The leader is at the front of the room. The connector is in the middle of the room. The connector is a person who I think of as being like a host or a host. They're the, the people who see in others what they have to offer. So we're back to host, hostess, and hospitality. And so that's the summary I can give you of what I think we, uh, we have learned. Let me stop and ask whether or not there are any questions, wonder, but that's all. Yes, sir. Thanks very much indeed for your, uh, your presentation. I was interested, uh, maybe it's reinforcing my own prejudice, but what's your view of the use of technology. I noticed that not only your presentation was blissfully non-technical, that's the yes. um, um, uh, so, so what's your view of technology in terms of association? So, so Facebook would be seen as a, but there, there seems to be in all your stories uh, very, very little technology. Do you think it's a force for the good or a force for, for uh, detriment? in terms of music. The average American, I can hardly believe this, but we check the research, spends seven hours a day in front of a screen. 
So what would they have been doing if they weren't? And we know from the work of uh, Robert Putnam at Harvard, who wrote Bowling Alone, that Americans increased their participation in associational life and association proliferated until 1969. And then it began to deteriorate. And it has ever since. And what was 1969? It was the time when almost everybody who had reached the age of 20 had been raised with help. So we know there's a close link between the decline of community life, association, and the use of technology. On the other hand, one plus that I see is that often technology can be used to bring people together, not as electrical friends, but bring them together around affinities that they didn't know they had. The degree, it precipitates real life face to face relationships. It's a useful tool. Yeah. Um, my question first of all, I'm from Canada. Oh. I'm in that area. Yeah. And when I first moved to Hamilton back in um, the 90s, there used to be quite active in having a but that has um, that has dwindled. I read last night that Toronto has a disability free. So how how would one go about reorganizing some disability awareness activities? Ah, let's see if we can go there the rest of my dive. <laughs> right, and the. the most complete answer is in this, in this okay. but we're, we're, we're going to move in that direction. And yes, sir. So just a question on your talking about institutions. Uh -huh. um, saying something like institutions cannot care. Yeah. And I just wonder what are the implications or what does that mean for those of us who are in the area of human services. Um, so just a couple of complimentary questions. So can one not care if you're in an institution? And can one only care if it's a voluntary association? Good. An institution can't care. Medicare can't care. Northwestern University can't care. People, if, if by care you mean what we mean, Care is the freely given commitment from the heart of one person to another. I care for Marsha, my wife, or anybody else in the world. I care for Ginger, our Labrador retriever, with all my heart. I care for this neighborhood so much I never leave it. Right? That's care. And that care is something because it's freely given that cannot be managed or provided. A person within an institution setting can care, but no manager can make it happen. That's the distinction. So to take the possibility that there are people who choose to care, but say the institution cares, is the great illusion. All the 100 largest universities in the United States have a uniform survey that they give the students at the beginning and the end of each year so they can compare themselves with each other. One of the questions is, does this university care about you? And um, this is true of our university, but almost all the big universities. At the beginning, about 80% of the freshmen come in and they say, Yes, it cares about us. Ask the same question nine months later at the end of the term. And 20% say yes, it cares about us. The for the laughing helps about There's your answer. So that, that is, right, people getting over this, this 20th century mythology about 
care providing, care management, managed care, the mythology. Now, the president of the university for that time, I knew personally, when I first saw this, I said to him, Bob, does that bother you? Oh, it doesn't bother me terribly. Because these people are going to be our alums, and I have to raise money. <laughs> I said, well, what are you going to do about it? There's an institutional manager. What are you going to do? These kids think they don't keep, you don't care about them. And he's a very wise man. And he said to me, I can't do it. He really can't. He says, I can present this data to the faculty at our one big faculty meeting where all 750 of the are there. And I can say, look at this, look what's happened. I'm telling you, I pay you, and this year, you get out there and you care. <laughs> <laughs> so, it's the mythology of institutions that they get. They might provide a context that would maximize the possibility that people would choose to care, or be able to care. That's, 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 that's yeah, that's yeah. Okay. Now, uh, I'm afraid we have to move on. I want to get the setting that we're thinking about. And then I want to report on a piece of research we did at the same time. That was we were interested in, in also trying to get a look at how inclusive the neighborhoods were we were visiting. And if we saw something especially impressive, why was it happening? And what I want to report to you is what we have found about communities that are especially inclusive, not because they have a culture of inclusion, because you can't create a culture very intentionally, but where, where there has been an, uh, a group of people who decided they wanted to do something that would make the community more inclusive. And so this is about intentional efforts to increase the inclusivity of the neighborhood. And there we found two kinds. The first is initiatives that are embedded in or adopted by an existing association. So, for instance, you might find an inclusion effort in a uh, neighborhood organization which is probably the best of all, in, uh, in a uh, chamber of commerce, in a uh, association of university women, within a community center, associated with a college, or a part of the work of a ministerial association or a council of churches. So one kind of intentional effort is to, to embed this in something that already exists. The other is to create something anew, to get six or seven people together who will become the center of this kind of initiative. The key thing about both of these kinds of efforts for inclusion is that they are civically centered. We spent some time with agencies training frontline staff on how they might introduce people into the map. And by and large, it produced very little results. On the other hand, when we saw citizen-centered civic efforts at the same time, they were much more successful. And the reason is, I think, that the idea that somebody who's a professional institution will lead somebody out in that map is unlikely because they don't know the map. But if you had embedded in, the, in with this association uh, a group of people who know the map, then they could find people at the edge and lead them back in. So it's, a, it's not putting anything down. But by and large, we no longer will spend time <coughs> training professional staff to be the key actors on including because we know a much more effective approach is 
to look at inclusion as a civically sensitive activity. So that's the first thing I can say. Uh, the second is that the people who are involved in the intentional effort are uh, people who we would call connectors. And connectors have, in general, four characteristics. You, and when you hear them, you realize that you cannot train anybody to be a connector. People are or they aren't. And in every community, there are all kinds of people who are connected. So what makes these civic efforts go is the fact that they find connectors who are already there and put them together. So I spent a year going around spending a couple days with people who were especially engaged in connecting. Few paid, most not. And these are the four things I can tell you about connecting. Number one is they are gift-centered, not deficit-focused. They see in everybody a gift and potential. Now, there are a whole class of people who like people, who help people, who are not gift-centered. They are called doctors. <laughs> right. My doctor has no interest in my telling him about all the gifts I have. He said, why are you here? Because he's a, he's a deficit man. And thank the Lord. I'm going to put it down. But that's not who we're looking for. In fact, I have a, a little inside rule, and that is never ever get involved in this kind of activity a person who has a, a master's degree or even an undergraduate degree in psychology. Because <laughs> they have learned how to name a thousand deficits in their head. And this is the opposite. Can you find a thousand gifts? They're gift sender. Number two, they're well connected on this map. Right. Number three is they're trusted. And I think they're trusted because they're gift-centered and well-connected, right? <laughs> so it goes together. <laughs> and the last is that they believe their community is welcome. And it's that combination that we found in the people who make up these initiatives that is key. So there, there are two ways to, uh, to organize them that we see. And the people you want are connections, are connectors. And the methods they use are, just put simply, they are connect, connecting gifts of people on the margins someplace on the inside of this map. And therefore, they have a clear map of what a community is. And that's why I share this with you, because I think that the mind of a connector has this embedded in it. They know 100 people in the neighborhood who they can tell you about what they can do. And, and they know who's head of the garden club, and they know who's the commander of the veterans of foreign wars. And they know who owns the mom and pop store, and they know the postmaster. So it's knowing that map and understanding that it is in that map that we're going to connect people who aren't connected, who are usually somehow institutionally embedded. Uh, the most common place that people tend to connect people, although the whole map is good, but the associational sector is probably the most important to know about. And one of the best connecting organizations one create a new that we have run across is in Prince George, Canada, a city of 90,000 in the northern part of British Columbia. And they have a group of seven people who decided that they were going to become the inviters of people at the end <coughs> into connections here and around their gifts. But they thought the most important thing they could do is to identify the associations. And so they put out a uh, every year, a guide to the local associations. And this is that guide. 
and uh, they had a junior college that worked with them. But there are 60 uh, associations on each page. This is the index. coming together about something they care about. So you can, if you look at it from that perspective, you see this is a list of care. What people care about. What's in their heart. And every interest you could imagine is here in this book. So that anybody who's in the margin who has any kind of gift or interest at all, there's going to be a point of engagement I always think when I first saw this, when I looked on the index, under the A's, the first one uh, uh, stuck out to me was Anti-Gravity Society. No. <laughs> <laughs> and what the Anti-Gravity Society is, is the Prince George Association of Jugglers. <laughs> all working against that. <laughs> I bring that up because these seven people who created Project Friendship, right, they came to see that you could ask a person, are you a juggler? And most would say no. But if you said, would you like to juggle? A huge number will say yes. So all of a sudden, right, they not only discovered gifts, right, but they, they discovered what people care about. That this is something that they can embed somebody with because of the mutual care. So that's what we can say about the process. And then language. Absolutely essential that the language be language disconnected from the service world. You don't want to be identified with human services at all in these groups. They are in the civic sector. Their sisters and brothers are a rotary club, a neighborhood organization, and not a human service agency. And the reason for that is that the human service identity labels the person and the label is what you're trying to get away from. What you're trying to do is to enter the values and language of community. And so listening to how people in these groups talk, right? And their language, let me just give you what I think are key words. They're about gifts. They're about building a strong community. They're about, I'm not so fan, uh, I'm a fan of this, but it moves some people. We take care of our own. It's about, we don't want strangers. It's about, we want citizens participating. We are a hospitable place. We are building community. We are about friendship. And we are about hospitality. And so those are the words that surround these civic ventures of connectors who are the gate of the bridge from the outside into the inside. And you have the best case study we know of one organization doing this, which is this, this publication here. Called Community Building in Logan Square. It tells about a neighborhood organization that took on the function that we here might call inclusion, but they call community building. Because in their mind, every time they got somebody connected into community life, that's their job. They become active citizens rather than people who are isolated. And that's their job, getting people to be active citizens. 
So I want to conclude by sharing with you, if you put this kind of effort together, uh, what's the outcome? This uh, neighborhood organization is called Loaded Square Neighborhood Association. It's on the near northwest side of Chicago. It is a largely Hispanic neighborhood. And it has a neighborhood organization made up of all kinds of associational leaders, made up the board. And the board set up a committee of five people to, uh, to become their community building passports, like their housing passports, and their employment passports, their community building, which means we're getting people who are not participating to participate, connected in the community. And uh, these five people are all people who have no particular relative who are labeled. So they are people who are operating from a community rather than a disability or mental illness perspective at all, out of their own experience. And they hired one person to be their sort of uh, administrator, connector of the connectors, and explorer of gifts among people who are at the edge. And so, let me show you if I can. I'll have to flip through a lot of stuff, so here. Yeah, here. This is after two years of having this community building task force, which bounced, I'd be six people at the time, they reported on the connections that they had made, and they did it with slides, and, and I <clears throat> took their presentation, and I, I'm going to show you this four, because they get an idea of the range of, of what they were about. And the, what I think is really important is they're conceiving how to do they weren't trained. People like us who go in and train people how to do this are making a huge mistake. They'll invent better than we can ever train. It's finding them, authorizing them, getting together and supporting them. That's, that, that's key. And then, don't get in the way. So at any rate, the first person the task force met was this guy, his name is Eddie. And so they, uh, they said, he was so easy for us to see what his gift was, and you can see it yourself. He said he's the most joyful person that we have ever known. And then he talks like this all the time, too. So between his smile and his voice, he, his presence is there. It's a, just an incredible presence. And so they said, we made a list, catch this, of Joyless places in Logan Square. <laughs> Where the gift of joyfulness would be what? And I asked, well, what is that? Whatever, whatever the like. They said the police station. <laughs> the high school where 40% of all the kids leave because it's so unjoyful. The hospital, nobody goes to the hospital except have a baby to joy. So they decided initially to see how Eddie liked the hospital, because they knew he had a gift. This is something he, he, he could get there. And they, the only hospital in the neighborhood is this, the last Norwegian left Logan Square in 1910. <laughs> <laughs> Polish people came, but the last one to the Poles left in 1950, and now it's a uh, Hispanic neighborhood. So the administrator is a guy named uh, Jose Lopez. <laughs> <laughs> and there you can see the effect that Eddie has on But what did they do? They weren't looking for a job. They were looking for a man who was isolated in a group home doing macrame, or his best transported to a sheltered workshop. They were looking for a man whose great disability was disconnection. What would he connect to when, when he was here? And so he walked around the hospital. They were one of them went with him. 
and he wanted to be in the operating room because the offices wouldn't go to him. <laughs> and uh, Lopez says, no, you can't do that because uh, the Board of Health says you can't have a person who's not a professional in the So Eddie he looked around more and he finally saw that there was somebody who delivers the mail to each department every day as a, a basket, wears a little, little uniform, a little vest, and goes up and down all over the hospital, and that what seemed great to him. So he said, can I do that? And they said, well, let's give it a try. Now, you wouldn't pick as a mailman somebody that doesn't read, and Eddie doesn't read, right? But what they did is they stuck animal stickers on each, a different one on each department mail, and then on the wall above the receptionist for each department, they put that animal sticker. So that you could deliver the elephant mail to the elephant lady. <laughs> <laughs> the receptionist. But the big thing that happened was, because he's a very self-important person, was as he walked down the hall going to the various departments, he began to look in and see people who were there, and he began to introduce himself. And he'd say, hi, I'm Eddie, who are you? And what's your name? Tiffany. And Tiffany would say, Tiffany. And he would say, how are you doing? Now, Tiffany had just come, come out of the uh, ICU. She's feeling terrible. And she says, terrible, Eddie. And Eddie says, oh, Eddie, can you hear me? Yeah. Uh, Eddie's working. And Eddie says, good. She says, terrible. He says, good. <laughs> No matter what anybody says, he says, good. Hi, I'm Eddie, who are you? I'm Lynn. How you doing, Lynn? Doing pretty good. Good! <laughs> Make any difference. <laughs> <laughs> now, the head nurse, when we were reviewing this, we did evaluation after two years, and the head nurse said, he's the great healer here. He said, because Second time he comes around, right? All of a sudden, he says these people know what he's going to say. It's very clear what his pattern is, and so nobody answers terrible the second day. <laughs> he says good, <laughs> right? And so what they say is getting better, Eddie, and he'll say good. <laughs> and he goes down the hall then, and he is not so. He says, mailman, mailman. <laughs> so everybody looks forward to him and he comes each day and he greets them. And he can remember the names of over a hundred patients. I don't know who labeled them, but he can remember that name. So then we asked uh, Lopez, the administrator, about him. We said, can you tell us how he's, how he's doing there? He says, I don't know much about him because I'm on the eighth floor and he delivers the mail on the seventh floor, other floors. He said, but I can tell you uh, two things about them. The first is, we have 17 departments that are all fragmented and I can never get them to do things together and we have an in-service training for interdepartmental communication. He says, and it never has changed the thing. He says, until two years ago, Sir Eddie came and we got together, they all knew each other. And he said, where did you meet? Right. And the answer is Eddie. Eddie would goof off on delivering the mail at least once a week. Right? He'd deliver the elephant mail to the foxes and the foxes to the elephants. And then those two receptionists would go and change their mail and get to know each other. And he did it at such a random basis that over two years everybody <laughs> <laughs> And so he said, Lopez says, you know, as a manager, I fail, right? But Eddie has succeeded in creating more real relationships in this hospital than I ever, ever have on my own. <laughs> and he says the other thing, which is really, really notable, he says, is we have about 5% of the population here that doesn't show up each day, but workers, about 700 people. So maybe 35, 40 people aren't here every day. He says, Eddie doesn't come every once in a while. And when he doesn't come, as I get four or five, sometimes six calls from people, you know where Eddie is. Mm -hmm. He says, every day I have 40 to 
50 people, uh, 35, 40 people, not here, and nobody ever calls about any of them. He says, so he's the only person I know who is really cared enough about the hospital that people will ask where he is. Second person is, is a woman named Mary. And Mary talked a lot about Jesus, a very religious person. So they introduced her to an association, a, a, a prayer group that has dinner in each other's houses every Wednesday, which Mary. And she's become very close friends with this couple here and knows a, a lot of the other people very well. And the man back there told us that she doesn't read, so she's good at the Bible study part of it. She says, but when we pray, she, she prays to God in a way none of us can. He says, she's our spiritual leader. And she ha had another gift from this perspective. She said, I'm too fat. So she was introduced to a weight reduction association called TOPS, Take Off Pounds Sensibly. And they made, because there were four officers, at least four, <laughs> made up the officers, so they made her special assistant to the president, who is the woman with the silver hair. And the woman with silver hair and she had become very close friends. And she, uh, when she saw this picture, she said, oh, it's Endeby, you were smiling. Because then she said, they go across the street to Ingler's, farm, uh, Ingler's ice cream store. <laughs> so she's the only truthful woman in the group. Right? <laughs> I got it. This is Beatrice. Now we're not, we're not looking for employment, we're looking for a relationship. Point of contact where friendship can be, begin to be built. And so one of the ladies on the task force Often of these people would just take the people who were at the margins with them right, and whatever they did. Right, they'd say, well, what should we do? We said, well, just, just have them go with you. Because they don't know the community, and you do, and there'll be an exploration and discovery for that. So when she went to the beauty parlor, Mary liked that probably best of all, and she sort of hangs there a lot of the time right, and, and talks with the women and has gotten to know the owner Beatrice very well. And Beatrice got married, and uh, she's a Catholic, and she uh, uh, had her child baptized, and at the christening, she needed a godmother. And there's the godmother. Now if you like diversity, look at that picture. Mary's an Italian-American. And this, this is a Puerto Rican family. And over and over again in this neighborhood, you can see how what are normally thought of as barriers dissolve when gifts to the center of what you're doing. Uh, third person is this man. This is Ricardo. And Ricardo mostly said, just stands and looks. And he, doesn't, he makes noise, but he doesn't talk words that people understand. And so they said it was very hard to figure out what his gift was. But one day when they were with him, a police car went by with a blue light and siren. And he rushed out on the porch, first thing they ever saw him do to was active, and cheered and waved his arm. And they thought, there's something about the police he likes. So two of them took him down to the local district police station. And they could tell him, as soon as he realized where he was, he just broke out of his mind. So they went to the district commander and said, we'd like him to be able to explore. He loves the place. He explores the place. And uh, of course, the district commander's name was O'Connor. That's part of the neighborhood. You need an Irish cop to they run the place. <laughs> and so to O'Connor, this idea that this man, <laughs> who doesn't speak and just stands or would be there it was not just the hottest idea that he had ever heard. And he said, no, I can't. And one of the two women said, now look, I'm a Puerto Rican, my brother's a Puerto Rican, my brother's one of your police officers. 
He said, now I'll tell you, there are 40,000 people in Lotusville. And 39,990 of us hate the police. <laughs> use this, you arrest this full Call us name. There's only one person in this whole neighborhood of 40,000 people <laughs> that likes the police. <laughs> and he's standing here and you say he can't be. <laughs> and that sold. And it sold, I think, not because probably the argument, but she also threatened to go back and tell the neighborhood. <laughs> So the power plays a role. So he agreed. And uh, so they they brought Ricardo, and Ricardo just was just happy. He just wandered around. But finally he found his place. And his place was with this man. This is Joe Dragon, who's the head of the vice detectives. And the picture doesn't display the way he usually is, because usually Joe is sitting down. And Ricardo stands behind him because he's a stander. He just stands behind him. And so we asked him uh, to go. He said, what's he do here? And he said, straight up, he's my guardian angel. And I'm the only police officer in the whole department of the guardian angel. And one day, Ricardo got out. And when Ricardo's out of the police station, we, we would say he lost him. And so Connor told us, I call the plan five. That means every police officer, stop what you're doing and find him. He said, we didn't call the plan five since the second world war. <laughs> and we had him, we had him in seven and a half minutes. <laughs> Our man. There he is. So remember this picture the rest of your life. When people say to you that people are out there in institutions, those kinds of settings, you can say, that's not true. Because I know that in the meanest, toughest place, in all of a neighborhood of 40,000 people, there is an institution that took a man wouldn't speak and doesn't do hard in the end. And they made him a guardian angel. And they cared so much about it. They stopped everything. And they thought it was a lot. There is welcome beyond any of our imagination. There it is. And the last Anne. Anne was uh, born six weeks after she was born. Her parents, on the advice of doctors, gave her to the Dixon State Institution for the Feeble-Minded outside of Dixon, Illinois, where 4,000 people were. And she lived there for 60 years. And then they closed it down. And in the system's great wisdom, they took this girl who had been in an institution in the country and put her in Logan Square, Puerto Rican inner city neighborhood. And it was the greatest thing that ever happened to her. It's the only great thing that ever happened in her life. And the task force people said, she's the grandmother everybody wished they'd had. So we almost fought over. And then we finally found one family that we thought we really could really use a grandmother because they didn't have any grandmothers within a thousand miles in that family. She lived, she was at 60. She came into the community building process in Logan Square. She lived three years and died. And his family said, she got served for 60 years and lived for three years. Uh -huh. So let's go back to the math and let me remind you what you've just seen. What you've just seen is Eddie, who was placed with a not-for-profit institution. And then 
Mary was placed with two associations in a small business. And Ricardo was placed with a public institution. And uh, Anne was placed with a family. So every neighborhood is filled with people waiting for us to activate. And this costs about thirty thousand dollars. What grows it? And what are the gifts that the community got? It's only you. A godmother, a guardian angel, and a grandma. Could there be gifts greater? All lost. Until a community based, civically engaged group began the connection. And just a quick review in two years, people were connected to these individuals and families, to these associations, to these businesses to these not-for-profit institutions, and to these government institutions. So if I wanted to trick you, I would have shown you this list first. And I, I would have said, so check off in your neighborhood whether any of these exist. Now, I'll bet 80 to 90% of things you check off in these. So then, you can begin to see. We have a hospitable community. We have contact with isolated people, but what we don't have is the connecting process. So that's how I can share. It is not rocket science. <laughs> and it's a huge possibility and a huge open. Now you have the, the story of this neighborhood, the neighborhood association. At the back, you can see the same list. Uh, places where people were connected. And let me just close with a, a note about resources. If you go to our website, there it is. And if you go to publications, and then go especially to downloadable publications, they're all free, and there are a lot that people interested in inclusion and youth. There are a few workbooks, and some of those might be interested in get the big 12 bucks for them. Everything that we learned about this process from the 3,000 stories is in this book, which is called Building Communities from the Inside Out. And uh, it's the best-selling book on community building in Canada and the United States. Is it the only book? Yes. <laughs> oh, you mean the only book that we have? No, I was yeah. just making a joke. The it's the best seller because it's, it's the only book. Oh, it's, yeah. No, no. Oh, there are hundreds of them. But there are about 120,000 of these that have been bought. And uh, then last of all, I read a book 20 years ago, and I just pulled it out last month and read it again, I only leave out. For people who are concerned about people on the margin, it's the greatest book I've ever read. And it's called The World I Live In. And the author is Helen Keller, J-E-L-L-E-R. And if nothing I can command that would be of greater value to any of us, I give it to all my friends because I think it is the greatest book on how do you know things and then know it so that you come to wisdom. And Helen Keller, who could not see and could not hear, wrote this book. And one other tip, I'm trying to do in every large institution I can. And so, promote small bookstores 
let me tell you that they have a website. All of those bookstores, independent bookstores, have a website. And it's A-B-E. -B. Just type in abe.com. And then type in the world I live in. The last few books if you want. And you'll see probably 60, 70 copies of this from bookstores in England, Canada, California, Florida. And so I encourage you to use that right, wherever you can to support community economy, community bookstore. And I know you'll never forget this uh, once you've read it. So the final word is. What makes this kind of community initiative work is getting away from the idea of service, including Christian service, of charity, and even of compassion. And instead, be gift-centered. Because if I have compassion, for you because of what I perceive of as a disability. My heart is with your brokenness, not the truth. So just centered people who can change and build them. So a community that grows and able power as a mind. And it is each of the people there. We need you. We need you. Don't let those people tell you your need. We need you. So that's the word from the neighborhood. Thanks.